Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, my presentation this evening on the uh, Civil War uh, Roundtable Congress. I'm uh, very appreciative, Mike, uh, inviting me to do this. I'm Mike Eisenhut from uh, Monrovia, Indiana, and I'll be speaking about the Iron Brigade at Gettysburg. I think it'll be an entertaining program for everybody. I'll have a lot of visuals. I'll keep the program moving pretty quickly for you all. And uh, let me get right to it. Uh, of course, uh, the Battle of Gettysburg, everybody knows what that is. I don't know, need to go into any detail there. 165,000 soldiers fight in Pennsylvania on July 1st, 2nd, 3rd of 1863. Uh, largest battle of the Civil War, of course, and even in the entire Western Hemisphere. Uh, the Iron Brigade, most of you have probably all heard of that and probably uh, know quite a bit about that too, but I'll get to it in uh, some better detail here. Uh, the Iron Brigade was uh, at Gettysburg, two years into the war, was five Western regiments. They're also known as the Western Brigade, the tall Black Hat Brigade, um, other nicknames too. But uh, three uh, regiments from Wisconsin, and then the uh, 24th Michigan, and then uh, the 19th Indiana. Um, but looking at this chart here, I pulled off the internet. If you start in the bottom left corner, just a basic uh, Army structure, uh, regiments, about 300 men at Gettysburg on average. Uh, the 19th Indiana, for example, had 308 men at Gettysburg. But they're part of the brigade, uh, so Almond Meredith's Brigade of the Iron Brigade, 1,829 men. They're part of the 1st Division of the 1st Corps of the Army of the Potomac. Of course, there are seven Union Corps at Gettysburg. And, uh, you know, the Iron Brigade had the distinction of being the 1st Brigade of the 1st Division of the 1st Corps. Uh, this is a uh, great painting by uh, Don Trarani of an Iron Brigade soldier earlier in the war. This would be after John Gibbon had taken over the brigade. They have the uh, white gaiters and the, the long uh, frock coat and, of course, the hat that uh, makes them all famous. This is a second Wisconsin soldier here. And uh, it's kind of maybe it's an apocryphal saying, but uh, anyway, this is something Rufus Dawes put in his book, Service with the Sixth Wisconsin. This was uh, just after the uh, Battle of Cedar Mountain. Uh, just uh, north of uh, Orange Courthouse. Um, a captured Confederate prisoner in the Stonewall Brigade, I think he was in the 4th uh, Virginia Regiment, comes across an iron, the Iron Brigade walking up uh, towards the uh, where the battlefield was, and the uh, Confederate soldier says he sees all the gear and the big knapsack and everything with the Iron Brigade soldier. Of course, these guys are running pretty thin these days with the, uh, the Stonewall Brigade. He says, you ones as pack mules and we ones as racehorses. I thought that was kind of a neat quote to uh, sum up the Iron Brigade uniform there. A couple more paintings of Iron Brigade here on the left. That's the uh, 6th Wisconsin and Antietam uh, paintings by uh, Rick Rees, both of these, I believe. And the one on the right is a uh, painting uh, of the 24th Michigan. This would be during the Gettysburg campaign. Uh, of course, by the Gettysburg, they've lost their gators and uh, they, they wouldn't have the long uh, frock put coats. Basically, uh, basically they be down to just their uh, four button sack coach as you see on the right and a couple more uh, paintings later in the war this is by my good friend on the left mark maritato of a, a 19th indiana soldier and uh, the one on the right is a keith rocco painting um, of an iron brigade soldier so the iron brigade's battles uh their first small skirmish is right after they uh, they muster in, in july of 1861 and uh the second wisconsin had already fought at first bull run but Abe Lincoln's called for more volunteers and the rest of the regiments have signed up now. But the first uh, skirmish that the four regiments at this point, the 2nd, 6th, and 7th Wisconsin and 19th Indiana are in, is a small skirmish at Lewinsville. Uh, but their real first uh, uh, baptism of fire is Bronner's Farm the day before uh, 2nd Manassas. And I'll get into that in just a minute. And then 2nd Bull Run. And uh, most of you probably know why I circled the Battle of South Mountain here. That's where they got their name. That's where they uh, got their famous name, the Iron Brigade. And I'll show you a quick story of, of how that happened. And then three days later, after South Mountains, the Battle of Antietam, and then Fredericksburg and Chancellorsville, and of course, Gettysburg. And after Gettysburg, uh, they were just a skeleton of their former selves uh, for the rest of the war. But uh, a lot of the soldiers were still there till the end, all the way to Appomattox. And like I said, this is, uh, I had a little thing here. It's, this is in my book, by the way, on page 53. Uh, two of my characters are talking. They're in Washington City in this scene, two of the brothers. And uh, I'll just read a short little uh, uh, paragraph here. I won't read the whole book, I promise. But uh, South Mountain, too, a couple days before Antietam, at a place called Turner's Gap. I read that's where you got your name Iron Brigade, John said with a smile, obviously proud of his younger brothers. General McClellan himself named the brigade that, right? Yeah, I think so. McClellan told General Hooker that we fight like we're made of iron, or that's what I heard anyway. You know they write about your brigade in the papers here? 
They call you the Black Hat Brigade, the Western Boys, Iron Brigade of the West, all kinds of things. And uh, so it is. That's how they earn their name. They fight like they're made of iron, and that stuck. That was uh, General George McClellan telling General Hooker that as the uh, Iron Brigade's coming up the National Road following the Battle of South Mountain on September 14th. And uh, like I said, three days later was the famous Battle of Antietam, September 7th, 1862. Uh, September 17th, rather, 1862. And uh, they suffer, uh, they suffer 43% casualties at Antietam. And they just suffered two and a half weeks before Bronner's Farm. They suffered 35 to 40% casualties, uh, depending on exactly what numbers you use and whether you include uh, Second Manassas on the 29th and uh, 30th of August. But uh, so they have their famous name at this point. And uh, this, uh, this, is, this is about the Iron Brigade at Gettysburg. It's not the bad. It's not, isn't the Iron Brigade at Bronner's Farm. But I will show you this. This is the Bronner's Farm uh, map from the uh, National uh, uh, Battlefield Trust, the uh, Civil War Trust. It's a picture of the Iron Brigade coming up the uh, Warrington Turnpike. And uh, what's going on here, uh, the brigade is, the, the entire division, Rufus King's division is moving up the uh, Warrington Turnpike towards, towards Manassas and towards uh, Washington City, looking for Stonewall Jackson's army. And uh, anyway, as they're coming up the pike, Hatch's brigade goes by, and then the uh, Gibbons uh, Iron Brigade is coming up the pike next. It's not the Iron Brigade at the time, it's the Western Brigade with the uh, 6th Wisconsin in the lead. And uh, they see a, a, a battery up on the left, up in the trees along the ridge line. They see a couple of horsemen. They just think it's a uh, part of Jeb Stewart's uh, uh, horse artillery. So uh, Gibbon uh, sends a couple of regiments off to the left, up through the uh, fields and through the trees, and they come up toward the Bronner's Farm. And uh, right there is uh, the Stonewall Brigade of Virginians, um, right by the Bronner Farm. And uh, John Pelham's uh, a battery, Confederates is uh, put it, put in a position there just on the west side of Bronner's farm, you know, for, for an hour, uh, right at sunset, these uh, two armies just slug it out. You know, they suffer horribly. And that was the uh, Henry Gates baptism of fire a uh, little over a year, about a year before Gettysburg. Uh, and, and I over here on the left side of the screen along Pageland Avenue here, uh, I circled this because if you want to go to a great civil war site, of course, everybody knows about Manassas, Boulder and Battlefield. But make sure you go to the Ranger program out here on Pageland uh, Lane. Um, it's a great tour of the Bronner's Farm area. And from there, there's trails that go up into the Unfinished Railroad Cut. And I, I think the Park Service does about two tours every day just from, just from that spot. So anyway, something to keep in mind. So I have a picture of this gentleman here, um, Isaac May. And I have this. It's kind of a personal story for me. I am from uh, Anderson, Indiana, originally we moved to Pendleton. Now I live down in Ruby. But uh, Isaac May was a major from Anderson, Indiana. My grandfather's name was May. And I saw this picture, and I thought this was the coolest thing ever. I thought for sure I'd be related to him, but I don't think I am. He had one son that was one year old when May's, uh, Isaac May was uh, the major of the 19th Indiana. He was originally captain of, the, of Company A from Anderson, uh, the Madison County uh, Company. Anyway, he's killed there at uh, Bronner's Farm. There's a couple of different stories on... Uh, he went down with a bullet in the leg, and then a couple of guys were carrying him, and they were subsequently shot. Some say he made it to a uh, hospital uh, further to the rear, but then the Confederates overrun that position. But anyway, they never did find his body, and, and even today they don't know where exactly he's buried. But anyway, I thought it was a really cool picture. He just had the one son, also Isaac May. I think he was Isaac E. May, not Isaac M. May. So, And then he didn't have any kids. But unfortunately, uh, I don't think I'm related, or that picture would definitely uh, be above my mantle. So Iron Brigade Commanders for Gettysburg. I mentioned Rufus King just br briefly. He was in charge of the division um, that the, that the uh, Iron Brigade was in going into the Battle of Bronner's Farm or Grove, the Battle of Grove, and some call it, or in the, the day before Second Manassas. Uh, Rufus King, and he kind of has an interesting story. He was born 1814, class of 1833 at West Point. He started as Robert Lee was graduating in 1829. Um, he was a real, uh, after graduating from West Point, he did well, fourth in his class, I believe. Uh, he moves, um, he's from New York and uh, spends some time up in the New England, Massachusetts, but eventually he moves to Wisconsin. And, he, and there you go with the uh, Iron Brigade connection, of course. Um, he, railroad man, newspaper man uh, in Milwaukee. But uh, unfortunately, he has a couple of claims to fame, but one of them is he, ha he suffers an epileptic seizure uh, a few days before Bronner's Farm in Manassas, and, or Second Manassas. And um, so the, the brigades are kind of in disarray at this point, going into Bronner's Farm as the march up the turnpike. He suffers another seizure during the battle and doesn't really relinquish his command to uh, Hatch or Doubleday or Gibbon or anybody. And uh, 
and that's one of the reasons, one of the many reasons that the, uh, you know, we suffered so much and didn't really uh, have the leadership we needed at um, Second Manassas. Uh, other brigade commanders, uh, the guy on the left, uh, he has a nickname, the Gray Wolf, which is a pretty cool nickname, but he was the colonel of the 6th Wisconsin, and he and he was in charge of the brigade a couple different times uh, during the Civil War. But really the man that gives the Iron Brigade their, their toughness, their discipline, their military uh, drive and sense of duty was this man on the right, John Gibbon. Uh, John Gibbon, uh, born 1827. Uh, he's born in Philadelphia, but he's raised in North Carolina. And uh, all three of his brothers uh, fight for the Confederacy. But at the start of the war, he's actually out west. I believe he's in Utah at the time. Um, uh, he's commanding a battery, that, uh, Battery B, the 4th U.S., which he, uh, in, in that battery, follows the Iron Brigade throughout the war. But he comes, he quickly comes back east and, uh, you know, right when the war starts and immediately throws his lot with the uh, Union, of course, even though his three brothers fight for the Confederates. But uh, he was a West Pointer and uh, class of 1847, I believe. He was a tough guy. He taught uh, uh, he taught uh, tactics. Uh, he knew a lot about artillery. He wrote the Artillerist Manual in 1859 that both sides in the Civil War used. You know, he's a stern guy. He's really the guy that gives the uh, uh, he, he, he made the soldiers. They loved and hated him. Right. They loved him for the discipline. They, they loved him because he made them tough. But what they didn't like was the uniform, of course. You probably have heard this story. He's the one that uh, brought back the hardy hat, the tall black hat. He made him wear the gaiters, the white gaiters. And uh, there's a kind of a funny story about that in just a second. And he, he wanted the army to wear the his soldiers to wear the long frock coat. Here's another picture in there. Um, this is Gibbon on the far right, John Gibbon. This is uh, Winfield Scott Hancock, of course. And uh, most of you probably know him, too. This is Francis Barlow, a division commander at Gettysburg. And this man back here, some may know, that's, uh, that's David Burney. He was in the Third Corps. He was the division commander in the Third Corps. Kind of a neat picture. There's another painting of John Gibbon. I, I, I want to make sure I always get the painter's names right when I have these up here. This is by, uh, this is by uh, Rick Reeves. And uh, a couple of neat things in this picture. Uh, this is John Gibbon here actually adjusting the screw along the Hagerstown Pike on one of uh, Campbell's battery's guns. This was his battery before the war, like I mentioned. Uh, young bugler over here. This is uh, Johnny Cook, who uh, gets a medal for his for his actions in the Civil War. But there's so many cannoneers down that at one point, this young bugler, a 14 year old uh, Johnny Cook, is running uh, from the wagons, the, the caissons in the back, and bringing ammunition up and stuff them in the gun himself. And at this point, the uh, the battery in this section is so depleted of artillerymen that John Gibbon himself has come up to the elevator crew and adjusted the Napoleon shooting into the cornfield at the uh, Georgians across the pike. Anyway, I think it's just a great scene. So, uh, so John Gibbon, like I said, he's a tough guy, and a lot of the men didn't like him. And uh, he comes out uh, he comes out one day uh, from his headquarters tent, and he finds his horse with uh, with four white gators on the legs of his horse. And uh, anyway, years after the war, as he's traveling out west, he goes through Wisconsin, he comes across a town and he knows there's a uh, reunion uh, of Wisconsin soldiers, the Iron Brigade soldiers there. So he comes up to this old barn. And this is the best I can tell the story. Anyway, he knocks on the door. They don't let him in. And then someone else comes and opens up and they say, who are you? And he says, I'm General Gibbon and I'm still looking for the bastards who dress my horse in white leggings. So he did have a sense of humor, at least, despite being a tough uh, military guy. This gentleman here, um, not everybody recognizes this picture probably, but uh, Iron Brigade uh, fans certainly would. This is uh, Solomon Meredith. Uh, he's your Iron Brigade commander at Gettysburg, and uh, he, he was a pretty good commander in the Civil War. Um, some accuse him of being a political general, things like that, but uh, I don't, and, and I'll get into that in just a minute. But this at Gettysburg, uh, this is your commander, Solomon Meredith. He also is from North Carolina, walks to Indiana as a young man, just prior to uh, the battle of Antietam, though, uh, he and John Gibbon are really into it. Um, Gibbon's upset because he's not at Antietam. And unfortunately, you know, he was a colonel in the 19th Indiana. The lieutenant colonel who takes the spot in Antietam is killed, uh, making a charge across Hagerstown Pike, uh, just near that where that house is, uh, was just demolished about five or six years ago that the trust brought up for the National Park. So Gibbon and some other people kind of held that against him. But Two, two and a half weeks before Bronner's Farm, he has a horse land atop and breaks ribs. Uh, same thing happens to him at Gettysburg, too. Um, he's at South Mountain briefly on September 14th, but uh, he has to go back to Washington City, Washington, D.C., and uh, 
convalescent wounds and uh, you know he's fatigued broken rib and uh, so i kind of give him a pass for missing antietam a little bit but uh, gibbon did not but unfortunately for uh you know for meredith like i said the lieutenant colonel of the 19th indiana was killed there so i brought you up in gettysburg of course gettysburg campaign um the leaders at gettysburg everybody knows the man on the left of course uh robert e lee the man on the right george gordon meade uh general joseph hooker had just been replaced three days prior um, so, so why does Gettysburg happen? I, I'll just, this is a campaign map that, that I'll show here. Um, and I think it's the Hal Jesperson map. I'm not totally sure here. But anyway, uh, just to give you a little bit of background, I'm not going to get into the, the deep theory of Gettysburg. But on May, on May 15th of 1863, a couple things are happening. Uh, first of all, General Lee is meeting in Richmond with Jefferson Davis and Secretary of War said in the cabinet, the Confederate cabinet about what to do. Lee has this bold plan to invade the North again. He tried it in 1862 during the Maryland Antietam campaign, of course, as you know. But he has this another bold plan, and he wants more brigades and more divisions to do this. A couple. The other thing that's really going on is on May 15th is they're burying Stonewall Jackson. So Lee and Davis have to reorganize their army uh, from two corps, uh, and they decide to make it three corps. They're going to replace Jackson with A.P. Hill and Richard Ewell. Longstreet uh, remains in command of the first Confederate Corps. But anyway, on June 3rd, uh, Davis finally approves the plan and Lee decides to do this. And they start moving out on, uh, on uh, June 3rd, 1863. They move west from their entrenchments across from the uh, Rappahannock River out towards Culpeper. And then using the mountains as a screen they, through Chester Gap towards Front, uh, Front Royal, they come down the uh, Shenandoah Valley, cross the Potomac River into Maryland. And now, just before the Battle of Gettysburg, they have 70,000 Confederate troops spread out over south central Pennsylvania. The Union Army, with orders to stay between Lee's Army and Washington and Baltimore, is ordered to move north. Do not let Lee attack one of these cities, but also follow Lee north. So, of course, as you know, uh, the battle starts on July 1st. That's the uh, junction of 10 main roads. And uh, Lee is up there supplying his army with food and wagon supplies, trying to put uh, political pressure on the, on the peace Democrats in the north to come to the, come to the table and end this war. To get into it, here's a map done by uh, my good friend John Heiser. He was uh, gracious enough to do maps for my book, just for my for my novel, which was very nice of him. Uh, but this shows what the uh, Union Army is doing as they're moving north. They cross the Potomac River at Edwards Ferry, uh, right here uh, into Maryland on June 25th. Uh, and then they march 10, 15, 17 miles a day on their way up towards Emmitsburg and eventually the Mason-Dixon Line, Pennsylvania. So June 30th, uh, here's a map I uh, pulled off of uh, Google Earth here. June 30th, they march into Pennsylvania and the Iron Brigade. Uh, and now they have the 24th Michigan with them, of course, who, who was added in uh, November of 62. So these five brigades, 1,850 men roughly, are camped along Marsh Creek. The 19th Indiana is set, is sent farther north and they're on picket or skirmish duty uh, up across the Emmitsburg Road, uh, just a few miles south of the National uh, Battlefield Park here, the current uh, uh, Gettysburg National Military Park. A long street tower would be right in this area here. So the 19th Indiana is pretty far ahead. They were the closest Union infantry units to the Confederates at Gettysburg on the morning of July 1st. Now, if you were to make this march, the Iron Brigade only marches about five or six miles that day from Emmitsburg up to their uh, encampments at Marsh Creek. Uh, this is what the scene would look like. Of course, there's several exits. And the first exit that the Iron Brigade takes, and uh, the, the old Emmitsburg Road, of course, uh, which now we call Steinware Avenue there. Uh, they make a left off the road and they pass by this house. Some of you may know what this house is. This is the Moritz Tavern, uh, right? The exit of 15 and uh, Steinware Avenue. And this is where General John Fulton Reynolds, the uh, major general commander of the Union First Corps, and command of about 10,500 men. This is where he spends his last night on June 30th. And he's up there receiving and uh, sending out dispatches from here up till about two in the morning where he finally lays down and goes to sleep. Uh, for his last night. Uh, he's killed the next day, of course. The Iron Brigade continues farther north, and uh, they pass Marsh Creek, camp along the water source here at Marsh Creek, and uh, it's still a campground today, by the way, as you can see uh, some fifth wheels and things back there. But the 19th Indian is sent farther ahead. So I got you to July 1st. Now uh, this is the big day of the battle for the Iron Brigade, of course. And uh, the Iron Brigade and the 19th Indiana and the rest of the regiments get onto the road about 7.38 in the morning or so. Cutler's Brigade has already moved ahead. Uh, General John Fulton Reynolds has ridden ahead. He gets to Gettysburg. 
Um, the Confederates have come down the Chambersburg Pike and they're pushing back the Union Cavalry uh, back towards town. Reynolds rides ahead and he sends back a message to me back at Tawny Town. And the, the note says, quote, the enemy is advancing in strong force. I will fight him inch by inch. And I've driven into the town. I will barricade the streets and hold him back as long as possible. So when Reynolds gets there and sees Buford fighting a uh, defensive uh, retreat from ridge to ridge, trying to hold the town, the crossroads of the town, Reynolds also decides we're going to hold this town. We're going to hold this junction. We're going to hold this high ground just to the west of the town along this ridge. So he hurries the army forward. Here comes Cutler's Brigade and then the Iron Brigade up the road. And they get to about the Kadori farm and they'll make a left-hand turn. The Iron Brigade, uh, just for scale purposes, they're about a mile behind Cutler's Brigade. So I, uh, Cutler's Brigade gets there a little sooner, comes across the Fairfield Road. And as you know, they set up along the Chambersburg Pike and up along the unfinished railroad cut here. But this is what it would look like, columns of four for the uh, for the Iron Brigade marching up the road. Uh, that's the Peach Orchard up here, just past these cars here. There's the Peach Orchard on the right. And uh, there's Seminary Ridge off in the distance. And uh, this is be about nine in the morning or so. They pass the Joseph Scherfe Farm. And uh, some of you experts may know what this uh, foundation is. This is the, the, the famous Henry Wentz Farm. Uh, their son was off fighting for uh, the Confederates. And he shows up at Gettysburg on July 2nd. So they continue past the Klingel Farm up here on the right. Now they're hearing cannons off in the distance to the northwest. And they get to the Kadori Farm. And this is a great scene. And uh, this is painted by uh, Dale Gallon, I believe. Um, this would be General Cutler with his, with his regiments behind him. And this is General Reynolds, and a staff officer. And I believe this is James Wadsworth here. Anyway, they're saying, hurry this way, this way. You know, he's trying to get Cutler as quick as they can, the rest of the Union First Corps, to help out the, the cavalry, which is uh, uh, trying to hold back as best they can before ultimately retreating back towards town. So Cutler's Brigade and then the Iron Brigade come onto the field, and uh, they come across the Fairfield Road, and they get into battle line right here. I put a lot of work into these X's, as you can see. This is off the uh, National Park Service map that you get at the visitor center. And the one, of course, is Auto Tour Stop 1. And here is the uh, second Wisconsin, the some reenactors here uh, with the seminary in the background, the Lutheran Seminary, and they're marching onto the battlefield. A uh, couple more uh, uh, scenes from Gettysburg here, modern day scenes. This is General Buford uh, with the cavalry, and here's General Reynolds just getting onto the field. There's another, there's another view of uh, General Reynolds' monument, two hoes in the air. Uh, some say that means he was killed in battle, and uh, that's not always true of monuments. It happens to be true here. Of course, he was killed, and the sculptor uh, decides to depict him that way. And this is just a great painting uh, by my uh, good friend, Mark Maritato, and he was gracious enough to paint the cover for my book, Brothers of War, uh, a few years ago, uh, right before the book came out. He uh, spent nine months painting my book cover, but he did this about 15 or 20 years ago. It's a picture of Charles Vale here uh, with General John Fulton Reynolds right behind him, leading the second Wisconsin in the woods. Uh, in this scene, Reynolds is about to turn over his left shoulder and yell to the Colonel of the seventh Wisconsin, who's next to come over the ridge, for God's sakes, forward, for God's sakes, forward. And as he does, he turns in his saddle and he's struck by a Confederate mini ball in the back of the neck, and he's dead before he hits the ground. And he's the highest ranking uh, Union general at the battle, of course. And uh, so now, uh, eventually, uh, command goes to Abner Doubleday, a division commander in the first corps. Uh, this painting here, I just I always just want to make sure I write. I shouldn't have written these down because it makes it harder to remember, but this is a uh, Don Troiani painting, and uh, it's just beautiful. You can just see the horse uh, rising up and Reynolds with the bullet here and, and, and Charles Vale and the Wisconsin state flag, and state seal on their second Wisconsin flag. And this is the monument here at the uh, National Park today, and there's a trail that starts right there. It goes through uh, uh, Reynolds Woods, McPherson's Woods, or Herbst Woods, whatever you want to call that. John Herbst actually owned that wood lot, but you know it's been uh, several different names over the years. And this little X right here, this would be where General Reynolds was when he's leading the Iron Brigade into the woods, leading the Second Wisconsin, the Seventh Wisconsin. There's a little bit of a delay before the 19th Indiana crests the ridge, and this is a map by John Heiser on my book on page 149. And the 24th Michigan comes across, but I will zoom in on this just a little bit. And you can see where the 19th Indiana comes across the ridge into this open field. The 7th Wisconsin, 2nd Wisconsin are battling Archer's Brigade. And they've actually taken their two right regiments and turned into this woods. So when the 19th Indiana comes across the ridge, 
they slam right into the right flank of the 13th Alabama and first Tennessee and uh, send them running back across the Creek after a couple of volleys. Um, this is what the scene looks like today. Not exactly today, but last fall, I guess. 19th Indian come across this. We call this East McPherson Ridge out on the battlefield. And the 19th Indian Monument, just for perspective, is right down in this area. The 24th Michigan would be over here, and then the 2nd and 7th Wisconsin Regiment uh, monuments are over here. But in this field, this is where the 13th Alabama, 1st Tennessee, and 14th Tennessee would be as they're fighting uh, towards the woods against the other Wisconsin regiments. They eventually push Confederates across Willoughby Run or Willoughby's Run Creek, and uh, the Confederates retreat about a quarter mile to the west, all the way out to Hare Ridge and reform. Um, but there's a great scene in my book. And I'll just read this little paragraph here. Um, young flag bearer, Abe Buckles, uh, 15 years old. He lied about his age. He's from Muncie, Indiana. To get into the, into the war, a volunteer, he lied about his age. And uh, anyway, he ends up in the 19th Indiana. And uh, I'll just read this little scene. Most of the Iron Brigade soldiers stop, stop just past the creek but several of them were still giving chase in the fields beyond. Come back with that flag, Abe, Lieutenant Colonel Dudley yelled, seeing their newest color bearer still running after the Confederates. It was only when young Abe saw he was alone in the field that he finally stopped and turned back toward the creek to rejoin the regiment. So Abe Buckles thinks he's chasing the entire Confederate army all the way to Hare's Ridge. Um, he, you know, he's so, uh, he, he's so excited with excite, you know, adrenaline and everything else. And um, the other color bearer, Burl Cunningham, had been struck already, so he gets the chance to carry the flag, and, and he makes the best of it. He's wounded at Gettysburg, by the way. Um, here's a picture of him. And uh, he receives a Medal of Honor the next year at the Battle of Wilderness. Um, he's struck in the arm, struck in the side, uh, has five wounds during the Civil War, loses a leg at Hatcher's Run. Um, but he still lives a long life. And this is his uh, grave out near Los Angeles. I think it's in San Bernardino area. Um, he returns after the war, one leg, uh, back to Muncie, gets his law license, goes to Indianapolis, practices law, and eventually works his way out to Los, uh, Los Angeles, becomes a district attorney in California, and uh, dies in 1915. Uh, meanwhile, the 6th Wisconsin, uh, my book is mainly about squatted characters in the 19th Indiana, so I follow that part of the battle uh, in my book, but uh, I don't want to do a disservice to the 6th uh, Wisconsin here. They're left in reserve, back by the seminary in this area. By the way, just for, uh, for perception here, for uh, give you a description of where this is at, we are facing... We're on the bridge, um, standing over the unfinished railroad cut at the time, um, facing Southeast Lutheran Seminaries here. This is General Lee's headquarters. He, you know, she makes his headquarters about five in the afternoon or six in the afternoon or so on July 1st. This is the 6th Wisconsin Monument. Well, as Davis's Confederate Brigade of uh, Mississippians and North Carolinians uh, come into this railroad cut and use this as a position to fight against the Pennsylvania New Yorkers, or the Pennsylvanians rather, and Stone's Brigade up along the pike, the six Wisconsin is sent across these fields and they battle with them from this fence. But Rufus Dawes orders the bayonet charge along with the 84th uh, New York, 14th Brooklyn, it's also called the 95th New York. But the six Wisconsin charges across this field, about a hundred yard field, and slams into the Mississippi Brigade uh, and uh, of the second uh, Mississippi Regiment. And I think it's the 55th North Carolina on the left end there. And they get around their left flank. This here is the left flank marker of the 6th Wisconsin, and the right flank marker would be dead, somewhere down in this area. And this is a great painting, too. Um, and uh, this is a, a Mort's Kunstler painting. Um, and it's just beautiful. And right here, it's Rufus Dawes, a lieutenant colonel at the time, uh, fighting against the 2nd Mississippi soldiers. And um, there's another painting. This is a, uh, I think this is Don Chirani here. And uh, this is Francis Waller of the 6th Wisconsin, and he is in a fight for his life for this flag with a second Mississippi soldier named William Murphy. And uh, there's just some great stories among what happens here. But uh, Francis Waller, he survives the battle, uh, gets the Medal of Honor for this fight uh, with this Mississippi soldier. The flag is eventually captured. And uh, I believe this is probably Lieutenant Colonel Dawes here in the background. Um, he, like I said, he's from the 6th Wisconsin, receives the Medal of Honor the next year in 1864. Um, here's another scene. This is drive a little farther on north here across the, from the railroad cut looking back. By the way, it's the 3rd Indiana Monument here at Calvary, and uh, I believe that's 147th New York. In the distance, you can see the 6th Wisconsin uh, Monument. So there's a midday lull in the battle. So for now, the Union has pushed the Confederates back. 
But a lot of things happen. Robert E. Lee arrives on the field sometime around 1 p.m. Both armies bring up reinforcements. And the Iron Brigade reorganizes and switches the um, their positions on the battlefield. They take the second Wisconsin, which takes a lot of casualties in the morning, and they move them to the middle, and they put the seventh Wisconsin out on the right flank. The second Wisconsin's moved to the middle, and over on the other side, they've moved the large 500-man 24th Michigan to the middle, and they put the 19th Indiana on the left flank. But I want to show what this scene is, looks like. Here's where the 19th Indiana is put into position with their battle line about 70 yards from the Willoughby Run Creek down here. Their right flank is down here. Their left flank's up in this field. This is a horrible position. They asked several times to change their position back to General Wadsworth, and General Wadsworth repeatedly says, that's the that's where you're told to hold. Uh, that, that were double days involved. Uh, Solomon Meredith wanted to change position several times. The Sergeant Major of the 19th Indiana, Asa Blanchard, went back uh, three times, according to most reports, uh, begging to change this position. The 24th Michigan would be over on the right. That's the, that's the uh, large regiment over here. And then far to the right would be the 2nd Wisconsin and the 7th Wisconsin. Uh, this is uh, John Burns, a 70-year-old uh, civilian, uh, War of 1812 veteran, he claims, uh, fought at the Battle of Lindy. He grabs his old flintlock musket as this fight's going on, and he goes up to the uh, colonel of the 150th Pennsylvania and says, I can fight, you know, he's bragging about what he can do. He has his flintlock musket, civilian clothes. And the colonel just kind of blows him off and says, now nah, go over in that woods, fight with those Wisconsin boys. So he goes over to the 7th Wisconsin and uh, they give him a different gun. But anyway, he, uh, he, he shoots several Confederates, including a lieutenant. And uh, this is documented. Um, I don't know the exact source on that. But anyway, he fights with the Iron Brigade uh, soldiers in the woods with the 7th Wisconsin. Kind of a neat story, you know. So, uh, and when, and by the way, when Abraham Lincoln comes to Gettysburg on November 18th, uh, five months later, this is who Abraham Lincoln wants to see, the hero of Gettysburg, he proclaimed himself. So uh, anyway, it's kind of a neat story, kind of a neat human interest story. And, and uh, uh, Tim Smith, uh, Gettysburg Lysis Battlefield Guide, you, most of you probably know who he is. He wrote a great book uh, about John Burns. So this is what the map looks like um, right before the late afternoon attack or mid-afternoon attack, let's call it, uh, by Pettigrew's brigade here. And I can zoom in on this. As you can see here, the 19th inning is on this left flank with this field. Uh, the, is, is an open flank for them. And uh, the 11th North Carolina gets around their left flank, the 26th North Carolina, 24th Michigan, and just a fight for their lives. Some people say 20, 30 yards away. They fight out for 40 minutes. Uh, these two regiments suffer two of the highest casualties of the whole battle. 26th North Carolina is the highest casualty count in the entire battle at Gettysburg. Of course, they fight on July 3rd also. Uh, 24th Michigan loses 80% of their men right here during this fight. And, uh, of course, Brock and Browse, Virginia, they get caught up. There's a stone quarry over in this area. It's really rough terrain, so they kind of get uh, held up over here. Um, so the second and seventh don't do quite as much fighting right here at this time like they, uh, the second did in the morning. But uh, eventually, though, the 19th Indiana and the rest of the regiments are forced to fall back in that woods. Uh, the 151st Pennsylvania comes up and takes huge casualties as well. But uh, ultimately, the Union Army is forced to retreat back towards the uh, seminary. Uh, one of the Casualties of the Battle of Gettysburg was this man, Lieutenant Colonel of the 19th Indian, uh, William Dudley. Uh, he's from Vermont originally, but uh, he struck in the leg. Eventually, they take him to town. And there's some great quotes that, that, that I have that he has said, from, and I've put them in my book. Um, the Sergeant Major says, it's my turn to carry that flag now. Um, but Dudley had rallied the men there in the middle of the woods after you know falling back once or twice. And uh, Blanchard tells him, Colonel, you shouldn't have done this. But ultimately, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Dudley will lose his leg. Uh, most of you have probably seen this. Uh, if you're a frequent visitor to Gettysburg, uh, this is the old courthouse. Uh, this was where the courthouse was during the battle. And uh, I think it was built there in 1859. But across the street, this at the time of the battle, was a Democrat newspaper, um, the Gettysburg Compiler. And the man running, Henry Stahl, Dudley was in here from the 19th inning and several other officers or men rather. I'm not sure they're officers, but Dudley was an officer. I think there was another officer too. But he goes across the courthouse to get help. Well, on the way, he runs into a lieutenant, a Confederate lieutenant. This, this is late. This is later in the day. This is probably seven in the evening after the unit had retreated through town. Kind of getting ahead of myself here a little bit. But anyway, he, uh, he needs a surgeon to come and help these 
these soldiers, especially Dudley, who's bleeding to death from the leg, they come across and uh, he gets the surgeon. But now all these men in this house, in this newspaper office slash house, are now uh, uh, prisoners under the Confeder- in, the, in the Confederate Army. And uh, so um, Henry Stahl, the newspaper guy, is arrested after the battle. And this uh, this 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 sign here outside that uh, outside that house uh, talks about that in Gettysburg. There's a picture of Henry Stahl there. And uh, by the way, the provost marshal for the uh, town of Gettysburg for the Confederates at this time was Harry Gilmore. He was a dashing cavalryman, rode with Turner Ashby's from Baltimore. He's, he was arrested right at the start of the war in April of 61 uh, for being a Confederate sympathizer and rebel rouser. But uh, he, he's released eventually, but he's uh, captured again in the Maryland campaign, but uh, rises back up the ranks in the Confederate Army and ends up. Uh, this is supposedly who. Stahl talks to him and, and a couple other Confederates about getting help for Lieutenant Colonel Dudley and others. There's a picture of uh, Harry Gilmore um, later on. I think that's probably after the war. Going anyway, back out to the battlefield, I can't always go down a rabbit hole now a little bit. I apologize, but I think it's a great human interest story. Uh, so now we're back to the, uh, late afternoon, about three thirty in the afternoon, so July first. Here's Henry Moore, the 24th Michigan, uh, waving his battle flag, trying to hold back as long as he can. They lose. Uh, somewhere in the area of 11 collar bearers, uh, the men they're fighting across from the 26th North Carolina loses up to 14 collar bearers, including their colonel, um, Henry Berglin. And uh, Henry Morrow is also struck in the arm by a bullet, and uh, he ends up a prisoner in town. But he's able to move. He puts on a surgeon's green sleeve, a green mark, uh, green uh, band on his sleeve, so he acts as a surgeon or disguises himself as a surgeon. So he's able to move around town a little bit and uh, communicate with some of the uh, captured uh, Union soldiers. There's a picture of Henry Morrow. He's a judge in Detroit before the war. Um, helped raise the regiment himself, 24th Michigan. And uh, another uh, casualty here in this on this battlefield in this woods was General Meredith himself, Solomon Meredith. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about him later. I'll try to save that for the end. But he was wounded somewhere in this area. Not let me move my uh, little. Uh, picture there somewhere in this woods towards the back of the woods in the late afternoon fight 3 30 3 o'clock somewhere during that time an artillery shell uh, explodes above his head and the horse's head and a fragment of the shell goes through his forehead at the same time a mini ball strikes his horse so the horse rises up um meredith ends up with a concussion unconscious pinned beneath his horse with broken ribs again like he had in 1862 and now a broken uh, thigh bone and he's taken off the battlefield. And so now the brigade is, you know, it's down to the regimental commanders. And uh, eventually, of course, William Robinson's the highest ranking officer. So by the time they get to Cemetery Hill, uh, William Robinson will be in command of the brigade. Here's a painting by Don Trani, um of the 19th Indian, trying to hold their position at the back of the woods. And this would be right before they, this, this fence would kind of be like what the park road is today, I guess. And then the background would be the uh, seminary, uh, Lutheran Seminary. And uh, this is a picture of Asa Blanchard uh, unshucking the flag. Uh, by the way, my good friend, Phil Spogey, who a uh, great historian on the Iron Brigade and, and um, North South Skirmish Association president for years and an uh, arms expert. This is him right here, he says. So he got his uh, picture in the, in the uh, painting here of uh, Asa Blanchard. But great, great scene painted by Don Tarani as the, uh, the 19th Indian is making that last stand in the woods before they finally retreat back to the barricade. So their final stand, this is late afternoon, July 1st now. This is about 4.30 in the afternoon. They've retreated to this spot, this small uh, barricade. It's a remade barricade, of course, right in front of Lutheran Seminary. And uh, this is looking the other direction from the barricade out. And as they look out here, Pettigrew's brigade has run out of steam, suffered a lot of casualties, and they kind of stay back here in the woods. There's a slight lull, just a few minutes. But then here comes parents, South Carolinians, coming across this field. Over on the right would be Scales' Brigade of North Carolinians, but here comes Perrin's Brigade across these fields, attacking the survivors of the Iron Brigade and Biddle's Brigade at this barricade. And uh, you can just imagine the emotion, what it's like to be here, knowing your brother's out in that woods wounded, your cousin, the people you fought with, and, and now there's less than half of you remaining. And here you are making a stand against just a, a, a huge uh, Confederate Brigade. They hold on as long as they can, but ultimately they're pushed back and this is a Dale Gallon painting here of the 151st Pennsylvania, uh, which would be just to the uh, left of the 19th Indiana, I believe, in the scene. And uh, right as they're starting to fall back, 
and a lot of emotion in this view. Really zoom into the faces and things. And there's a Lutheran seminary in the background, the cupola. Here's a uh, one of John Heiser's maps he did for me. And it depicts a scene. Eventually, the Perrin, Abner Perrin and the South Carolinas get through a gap in a fence here. Uh, they have a Buf some of the Buford's cavalry that they have to contend with too. But eventually, they do get behind uh, the left flank here. And ultimately, the entire battle line is forced back in the town, and it becomes a route through the town of Gettysburg. Um, one man left on the battlefield is this uh, young soldier, Sergeant uh, Jefferson Coates of 7th Wisconsin. And uh, there's a famous story. He's been shot through both eyes. And uh, I don't know if this scene takes place at night or, or, or more like 5 in the afternoon as the Confederates are overrun in the woods. But I think it's at night. And he's out in that... Uh, Reynolds, McPherson, Herbst Woods, and uh, Confederates have come up to him and try to pick his pockets and things, and uh, and he fights them off with a bayonet, and he's laying out on the battlefield uh, for several days, but he gets awarded the Medal of Honor uh, later on. And I want to read a short thing here. This is in the Lutheran Seminary Ridge Museum, which is a great museum, by the way, and it talks about Coates. It says, during the fighting in Herbst Woods, 19-year-old Sergeant Jefferson Coates, 7th Wisconsin, received a gunshot to the head. The bullet entered just behind his right eye and exited his left temple. He was left behind, left blind and bleeding. Resisting an attempt to loot his body, Coates was bayoneted. Amazingly, he survived until the battle was over and was carried to the seminary. On July 8th, Coates was transferred to, uh, to a hospital in town. But anyway, this is it's a great, uh, one of the many great things they have in the Seminary Ridge Museum in uh, Gettysburg. So I, I strongly recommend you, you uh, see it. By the way, the picture from a few scenes ago by Dale Gallen, he did a lot of wall murals in the, in the um, museum and they're on the, I think the third and fourth floors over here. It's pretty neat. It's worth the trip. Um, there's a, a later picture of Jefferson Coates. And uh, like I said, he, he awards the, he's awarded the Medal of Honor and uh, dies in 1880. So now uh, the Union Army, the Iron Brigade, 19th India, everybody's retreating through town. And uh, it's early evening, July 1st. And there's a great uh, article I found from the uh, uh, from Plymouth, Indiana, a newspaper, um, you know, 50, 50 years after the war. And I'll just read this. This is one of the 19th Indiana soldiers. It's a captain in uh, Company A of the 19th Indiana, uh, Alonzo Makepeace. And so most of the Iron Brigade fans probably know this story. It's also, I think the story is also in Lance Ferdigan's book and maybe Alan Gass' book, too. But uh, anyway, I'll just read this short little clip from the newspaper. During the fight at Gettysburg, our regiment was ordered to hold a point at any cost. But when the Corps on our right gave way, 11th Corps, they're accusing them of, the Confederates struck our flank and every man was instructed to look out for himself. I got into the town of Gettysburg and started down the street, swept by artillery as well as by rifle fire. As I ran down the street, I came upon a man standing in his own yard. He started to go into the house, I behind him. Just as he was in the act of opening the door, a bullet struck him in the back of the neck, and he fell dead. I ran around the house and across the alley and went into a barn, which was soon surrounded by rebels, and I was a prisoner. So it happened I was one of the 3,000 Union prisoners captured at Gettysburg and taken to Libby Prison. But anyway, um, Alonzo Makepeace's story is, is amazing. He attempts to, uh, before the war, to go to uh, California after the gold rush. But anyway, uh, goes through Nicaragua, he comes back. He, he ends up in Libby Prison in Richmond. They transfer him down to uh, South Carolina. Months later, they're taking him by train to Macon, Georgia, and he jumps from the train and escapes. He's recaptured several times, but he spends 20 months in Confederate prison. Finally, makes his way back, walks over 400 miles to Indiana, comes to Indiana Anderson, where he grew up, and becomes a sheriff of Madison County. And, and, and a lot of the story was brought to me from uh, – uh, Steve Jackson, who's a great historian, Anderson, a newspaper writer. And when I spoke there in Anderson, they, they make pieces house is just right down the street, this one block away, which is pretty neat. And it still exists today. The mule train charge. I don't know how many have heard of this, but uh, you never really hear about the Iron Brigade running out of ammunition, uh, at least during the afternoon, the morning afternoon fight. And uh, the reason why is they got their ordnance wagons all the way out to the battlefield. From what I understand, this scene is out in front of the uh, this is out in front of the uh, Lutheran Seminary, in front of the barricade, somewhere between the woods and the barricade. And uh, this is a painting by Don Stivers, by the way. And this is Jerome Watchers, a sergeant. They've jumped off the uh, wagon and just throwing out ammunition to the Iron Brigade soldiers. But the 
the, the neatest part of the story, these wagons come back to Cemetery Hill empty. They're riding through past Cemetery Hill. By then, Jan, uh, Winfield's got Hancock's on the uh, on the battlefield at Cemetery Hill, and he sees these wagons come through the battlefield past the uh, town cemetery, I think is where it was. He says, so my God, how'd you get these wagons up here? And, and Watchers tells him, he says, yeah, we, we already unloaded the ammunition out by the seminary. We're going back to get more. He goes, wow, I've never seen a mule train charge before. That's kind of a neat quote by uh, Hancock. So just to sum up the first day of the battle of Gettysburg, of course, it's a huge uh, Confederate victory. Um, they come onto the battlefield with 30 some thousand men, you know, um, and, and the Union was only able to get two corps there, the 1st and 11th Corps. Ultimately, the Union retreats back to some through town, cemetery to Cemetery Hill. <clears throat> the 1st and 11th Corps are absolutely destroyed. Both suffer well over 50 percent casualties for the Corps, which is a huge number. And uh, but now the Union is in a great position back here on Cemetery Hill. Yes, the Confederates hold the crossroads and all the, you know, of the town and all the roads uh, leading out of town, except for the Baltimore Pike and the Tawny Town Road. And the battle goes on for two more days, as you know. This is a picture of the town cemetery, um, the Evergreen Cemetery built in 1854. And this is be a, over here on this knoll. We call this Stevens Knoll or McKnight's Knoll, McKnight's house is back here. The Iron Brigade survivors went to this position up along where this fence is now and into the woods. 24th Michigan would be here, the 19th Indian is somewhere in here, the 7th Wisconsin's here, the 2nd Wisconsin, and the 6th Wisconsin, which fight all three days, by the way. The 6th Wisconsin fights all three days um, over on Culp's Hill, the 2nd and 3rd. Um, this is their position for the survivors. And uh, I, I'll i read this uh, marker here for the 24th Michigan that's there uh, near one of the auto tour stops on Stevens Knoll. The 24th Michigan, 24th Regiment, Michigan Volunteer Infantry, the Iron Brigade. Of the 496 men who went into battle on July 1st, 99 answered the roll call here on the morning of July 2nd and 3rd. They suffer 80% casualties out there on July 1st. This would be their view as the North Carolinians late in the evening make this attack on cemetery against Cemetery Hill. The fight over in Culp's Hill has already been going on over in the woods and farther to the right down around uh, Spangler Spring and Lower Culp's Hill. But this would be the view looking out as the North Carolinians are coming across this uh, this attack. This is the 24th Michigan uh, little marker here. This is the 7th Wisconsin. The 19th Indian is, so, there's no marker for the 19th Indian on this part of the battlefield, but it's somewhere in here is where their position would be, maybe even lower near a stone wall down here. And then the 2nd the and 6th Wisconsin are back in this woods. This is looking back the other direction. This is a, a marker for uh, uh, the battery there. Um, I don't know why I'm drawing a blank on that, but uh, uh, yeah, anyway, uh, there's Evergreen Cemetery there and uh, 24th Michigan's in this area. And here's the uh, 7th Wisconsin. Stevens Battery, of course. That's why it's Stevens now. Um, uh, 19th Indiana position here, 24th Michigan. And they would have been firing into the flank, I think, of these North Carolinians. And the North Carolinians eventually do push some of the Union soldiers off this hill. And they do capture uh, at least a few, maybe several of the cannons up here. But the... Union Army gets tons of reinforcements from the other side of the battlefield, namely the 14th Indiana and the West Virginia regiments and the uh, 4th and 8th Ohio come across here, uh, Samuel uh, Carroll's brigade. And uh, ultimately, the Confederates are pushed back. And that's kind of the end of the fighting here for uh, this part of the Iron Brigade. Like I said, the 6th Wisconsin is sent down this direction later. Here's a great painting by, uh, I think this is Dan Nance. There's the uh, Evergreen Cemetery Gatehouse and uh, Stevens Battery fighting uh, just behind the Iron Brigade. And today there's some there's there's some great trails. This part of the battlefield has been preserved very well. There's a trail between the 6th Wisconsin and the 2nd and 7th Wisconsin regiments here in the woods. It's a neat place of the battlefield. Uh, Henry March, in my book, he plays a little bit of a part here at the end. Um, he's a hospital steward and assistant surgeon for the 19th Indiana. Just kind of sum up the casualties for the uh, entire uh, first corps here. They, like I said, they lose over 50% of their men. And uh, that number shows 49.6, depending on what number you really look at. Um, I don't really think there are 12,200 there. I don't think they're all engaged. But the Iron Brigade, by most reports, uh, loses 1,200 of their 1,800 men, roughly, um, depending on which uh, source you use. But this is from the uh, this is from Philip Lano's uh, uh, Order of Battle on the back of his uh, map book, which is a great book, by the way. I never go to the battlefield without it. It's a spiraled uh, 
book over 500 pages, I believe. Yeah, but anyway, Philip Lana's uh, map uh, book in the back has a great order of battle, and this shows the casualties. 19th Indiana suffered 68% casualties. And we always talk about numbers. I do want to throw this out. You guys have heard this before. But for every one of those casualties, that's a whole family back in Michigan, Wisconsin, or Indiana, in a town. There's so many people affected by every single one of those numbers. So it's sometimes we, we just talk about numbers. And, and you know, one soldier's killed, it affects the whole town. And you have this kind of numbers. It's just devastating. This is a uh, bad selfie of me. And, a, and this guy on the left is an absolute hero, by the way. Um, there are no good selfies of me anymore, but that's a side. This is Lieutenant Samuel Schlegel. I want to tell his story. I'm almost done here. I'm getting close to the end. Lieutenant Schlegel was one of the men in Company B, which is my characters are in Company B of the 19th Indiana, and he is left on the battlefield. He's wounded July 1st. Our Company B was sent out as skirmishers July 1st during Pettigrew's attack. They're out there. 14 of the 30 get captured, and uh, Schlegel shot through both legs. And uh, on, on July, so he's laying on the battlefield for the rest of the battle from July 1st to, you know, until July 5th when uh, the survivors, uh, the 19th Indiana come out, they come out through the town, they gather a couple of their wounded, they find more of their wounded in the Lutheran Seminary, they bury some of their dead, and they go out to the McPherson Woods, Herbst Woods. They find Schlegel out there near Willoughby Run. You know, of course, he needs water, food, everything else, bleeding to death. He never recovers. He comes back to Indiana, he survives, but he never recovers, he dies in. Um, 1866, just uh, two and a half years later. Um, Samuel Williams, he's a colonel in the 19th Indian, does, does heroic service at Gettysburg um, from Selma, Indiana, just east of Muncie. He survives Gettysburg, not wounded at Gettysburg, but he is killed the next year at the Battle of Wilderness on May 6th to 64, and he's buried there just east of Muncie. Joel Meredith, I talked about him, like I mentioned earlier, some accuse him of being a political general, whatever, but in 1834, he's elected sheriff. In, in, in uh, of uh, Wayne County, Indiana, and he ends up being a U.S. Marshal. He was a Quaker. Um, he's a Freemason, abolitionist, of course. Abraham Lincoln called him his only uh, Quaker general in the whole army. But anyway, he uh, he gives all three of his sons to the war. They all serve. Two of them were wounded badly. Uh, his his oldest son is killed. Uh, he, 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 he suffers more than Gaines, uh, Gaines Mill, an attack at Gaines Mill out on the peninsula. He dies in 1864, I believe, two years later after that. His other son uh, dies in, uh, David dies in 1867. And uh, even his youngest son, Henry Clay Meredith, dies in 1882. Um, so to me, Solomon Meredith is a hero, in my opinion. And uh, he was friends with uh, Governor Morton, and, uh, you know, a big supporter of Abraham Lincoln, of course. And he probably did get the job of Brigadier General because he was knew a lot of politicians. But, you know, he did, he, he served his country before that, too. And so I, I, I give him a lot of credit, you know, and, and he never serves in the field again after being wounded at Gettysburg. You know, he's wounded several times, has at least two horses shot from underneath him. And this is his grave uh, just on the west side of Richmond, Indiana in Cambridge City. And he has a great wall mural in a liquor store with the uh, Iron Brigade symbol down here, which is pretty neat. I've seen me in there. There's another picture of him. He dies in 1875. Six foot seven, nicknamed Long Saw. So my book, I'm almost done here. I just got, I just, I just got a couple more slides. So uh, why did I write the book? Um, about 11 years ago, I'm in Gettysburg National Cemetery. I studied Gettysburg my whole life. And uh, I see a grave in the Indiana section with the last name Whitlow. That's my grandma's maiden name. And a company being 19th Indiana, I knew that was part of the Iron Brigade. So I did everything I could to learn everything I could about this soldier. Well, and I found out he had a brother that fought with him too. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna give it away the first name here, but he and his brother fought in the 19th Indiana. They had an older brother that fought with the 30 Indiana Cavalry. Um, I read everything I could and I studied everything I could, uh, you know, pulling uh, a lot of secondary sources, first, you know, uh, firsthand accounts, diaries, letters, everything else. And eventually, about seven years ago, I decided, you know, I'm going to write this book. It's going to be a novel now. I'm going to write it. And I'm going to try to really honor what these guys have done, you know, so they're remembered. And that's a picture of my wife and son back there. This was in the Indian section. I didn't know that at the time when we were walking by those graves until I saw the 19 on it. And uh, I want to give a shout out. This this scene uh, of a couple, Mark Maritato did this, this picture for me. It's just beautiful. It's cropped for the cover of the book here. But it has the main character of the book. There's Solomon and James Whitlow. 
Elijah Hawkins. He goes by Hawk. It says Hawk on his cartridge box there. There's Colonel Williams, the NES state flag and the national colors. And this is their battle line at about uh, three in the afternoon, or two thirty, three in the afternoon or so as Pettigrew's brigade is coming across the creek. But uh, I just want to talk about these guys for just a second. Uh, Hawk's a tough guy in the squad. I, I, you know, the squad loves and hates him. And, and in my book, I think he's most people's favorite character. But uh, towards the end of the uh, – during the retreat through the town, about three-fourths of the way through the book, there's a scene. Um, and Hawk's been shot. And I'm not giving anything away here, but Hawk's been shot. And, and they go to this back of this house, and Solomon is banging on the door. Let us in. Let us in. We're Union soldiers. Please, my friend needs help. He's dying. And then the next chapter is two and a half years before. And you find out why Hawk, why just, is the tough guy he is. You find about about his past. You find out why his family – uh, he never got letters from his family. You find out um, really what drives the character. And I think people have loved this next chapter. It takes place before the Civil War in a different state far away. And I got out of order just a touch. But I want to go back to this. But I end this first chapter in this woods. Everybody knows this is McPherson's woods here, Reynolds Woods. This is the McPherson barn. A lot of my good friends in this picture on a battle walk a year or two ago. And uh, the, the book starts in this woods at uh, 11 o'clock at night on July 1st with a wounded soldier, James, one of the main characters in the book. And you don't know what happens to this guy as you're reading the book. All you know is it ends with this little scene here where uh, there's Confederates coming towards their hiding spot. And the next chapter is two weeks earlier down in Virginia. I just got one more slide here. I just want to read this. This is uh, something I put in the front of my book. It's just a little, uh, a little saying, just to kind of honor memory to the, to the people that fought there, the, the people that gave their lives for, for the country, the nation, you know, and, and on both sides, just everybody. Uh, the National Park Service, the people that take care of the park now, the people that visit it. And I normally don't write in this kind of flowery language, but I did put this one paragraph in here before the book starts. It says, days turn to weeks and then to seasons, and winds blow and leaves fall, and long winters cover them in snow. But spring always brings warm sunshine, leaves, grass, and flowers. As we walk this field, those honorable men's final bivouac, their stories must be told by our generations and those not yet born. While souls linger, entire lifetimes pass, and this hallowed ground changes, but still, the memory of what they did here shall endure forever. And that's all I have for you guys. I appreciate it so much. I've enjoyed it. Um, I'll, I'll be on here for uh, quite a while. Take any questions. I'd love, I'd love talking about this. I'd stay on as long as you guys all want. Again, thanks, Mike Movius and the, the, uh, the uh, Civil War Roundtable Congress for doing this for me. And... Uh, Thank you very much, everybody. Have a good night, and uh, I'll stay along and uh, answer questions.